So today in class, you explored the concept of upwelling. Um, this is very important, especially along the Oregon and Washington coast, as it will cause um, water to move away from shore because of the way the wind moves, which causes the upwelling of colder water and nutrients. Um, because that those nutrients come up, it enables more photosynthesis to happen as long as the other conditions are right. Uh, a term you may have heard before is El Nino, and that actually has to do with upwelling or the lack thereof at certain times of the year due to certain pressure changes. So um, during an El Nino year, there's a change in sea surface temperatures, which changes the weather patterns, um, including the wind. Uh, because of that, there's less upwelling where there's usually a lot of upwelling, which means that there's less nutrients, so less photosynthesis, and less bioproductivity. So the areas that normally have very good fisheries and very good um, fishing industries actually end up with a very poor industry that year and poor fisheries because of El Nino. There's an opposite called La Nina, uh, which produces the opposite conditions, and then you also have uh, a I think they call it a neutral year, and that's where conditions are normal. The winds will also drive surface currents. Uh, when the wind blows across the water, so you have the wind blowing at a particular direction, and then you've got your water um, there. The, wind, the water doesn't move exactly with that wind. It tends to actually move at about a 45 degree angle, and that causes surface currents. Uh, the deeper currents can be caused by many different things. It starts with the wind, but generally your surface, surface currents are driven entirely by the wind. And that's influenced by the Earth's rotation and gravity of the moon in that the Earth's rotation causes each successive layer of water to move at a 45 degree angle from the one above. Uh, this creates what we call a gyre, which is a very large circular swirl of water. It's very slow moving. Um, and you might have heard the, of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is because the Pacific Gyre has collected a lot of trash. And it's theorized that there are probably trash patches in the center of all the other gyres as well, which they've discovered since is trash. So here is the surface currents. These are the major gyres. When I say they're big, they are big. So here's the North Pacific gyre, here's the North Atlantic gyre, and right there, about in the middle of it, you have a garbage patch. Now this one tends to be very, very large, and it's the most studied one. Uh, at this point in the ocean, in the center of the garbage patch, there's actually more plastic by mass than there is plankton. Currents are also driven by temperature, as you learn in elementary school. Um, heat rises, cold, temp uh, cold temperature water or air sinks. So the, as it warms up, so as the temp goes up, so does the mass, whether it be air or water. And as the temp goes down, so does the mass, whether it be air or water. And this affects air currents, and it also affects the uh, water currents. And then you have density. Remember that um, the more dense something is, the more it sinks. So in a water column, generally the most dense material is going to be on the bottom and the least dense material will be at the top. Of course, this means too that um, the nutrients concentrate down here at the bottom. That very dense bottom water has a much higher salinity, which as you learned in the last unit was um, the amount of dissolved salts in the water. Again, that's more than just the table salt. There's lots of different salts in the water. This can affect organisms. As you learn in biology, it affects their uh, ability to control their osmosis, which can cause dehydration. And it can also affect their ability to build things like shells. So the more calcium salts, calcium carbon and carbonate salts you have in the water, the more is available for organisms to build their shells. The more acidic the water, the less of that salt is actually available to them. So this is an example of what we call a thermohaline. Um, the haline being salinity and the thermal being temperature. So this red line here shows temperature as you go down in depth. So this is down towards the bottom of the ocean. So as you can see, it starts relatively high, it drops, and then it's relatively stable for a long period, and then it drops dramatically. Uh, the same thing can be said for your salinity. 
it's relatively stable at the surface, and then all of a sudden it drops very dramatically. So you'll see your temperatures hover right around freezing and your salinity hovers right around, it's very high, um, and it hovers right around 35 parts per thousand depending on your location in the ocean. Near the poles it actually tends to get a higher salinity. So tomorrow you are going to be working with a system called NANUS, which is a, um, an NVS system. It's basically a system of buoys and various uh, weather stations all throughout the northwest. So you're going to use the NVS uh, by clicking on NVS over in the um, table on the left side. It doesn't seem to be working right now. So we'll try adding another one here. Um, I think the browser's just not working. So, nanus.org. And this website has available to it the NVS system. There we go, now it's working. And the Data Explorer. So tomorrow you will use the iPads in class um, and a guided activity to explore how up, whether upwelling is happening here or not and finding evidence for that. And you do that by using these various buoys um, with their different types of, um, let's see, get a pen here, uh, different types of information. So you, they've got air temperature, they have water temperature, and they even tell you how deep that water temperature probe is. So this is um, minus two feet from the surface. They give you wave, height and feet, you, wave direction, wind gusts, and wind speed. Uh, you can also do various different uh, filters where it'll overlay wind direction. So this is tomorrow in class.